we're part of the Improved North Publishing Group. We publish Dr. Aurelia's Environmental Science Textbook for Advanced Placement Courses called Environmental Science for AP, now in its second edition. You may be familiar with the first edition, which had trees on the cover. We've now moved to butterflies. Dr. Aurelia has a ton of experience teaching environmental science, and his specialty is actually water-based. And he's going to tell you a little bit about his background and then talk about some of the issues that have been happening across the country in water conservation as well as specifically in California. If you have any questions, please send them to me in the chat. We will be taking questions at the end of the webinar. We will be taking questions at the end of the webinar. So I will unmute you then so you can ask your question or you can send it to me in the chat. So Rick, I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Nicole, and, and thank you to everyone for taking the time out of your busy schedules to uh, make some time for the webinar. I'll talk for about 20 minutes or so and, and uh, about some of my background and then some of the water issues uh, that we currently face, uh, particularly those in California, which many of you may know quite well. But first, I thought it would be helpful to have some background. And let me see if I can get it to go. There we go. So a little bit of background about me. I grew up in upstate New York and uh, spent a lot of time outside, as you imagine someone might do, who's uh, interested in environmental science. My undergraduate degree is at uh, the State University of New York at ESF where they have uh, forestry, wildlife, those kind of uh, programs, as well as environmental sciences, and uh, spent lots of time doing research as an undergraduate on a number of different birds uh, up in the Adirondacks of New York. Went on then to uh, Texas Tech University, studying something quite different, studying mule deer down in Texas. Spent a few years down, and this is done by Big Bend National Park. And then moved on to a PhD where uh, I became an aquatic ecologist. And uh, that's where I really received most of my training. And, and uh, this is some of the crew, uh, as you can see, uh, well equipped for studying swamps, ponds, wetlands, et cetera. So uh, from my PhD, I went on to the University of Pittsburgh. And for the, uh, about 15 years, I was a professor at the University of Pittsburgh, studying all kinds of aquatic issues from the basic to the very applied, everything from uh, understanding how ponds and wetlands and the animals living there uh, interact with each other to really apply to issues about pesticides and what pesticides do to animal populations, ecosystems, uh, food stuff, all of those things together. Lots of press from that work to give you a, a sense of the work that we've done. Here's a story in the New York Times about some of our work on discovering how pesticides can be much more deadly to amphibians than we ever knew how uh, amphibians can spread des deadly diseases, some other work that we did with some uh, folks in Oregon, and then uh, some newer work showing that amphibians living close to the farms have actually evolved higher resistance to pesticides. So just a little bit of uh, background in terms of what I've done in the past. This is a recent shot of my research group. And I like to show this picture um, because the gentleman second from the left in the medium blue t-shirt he and the woman in the white shirt with the white t-shirt, both of those are high school teachers. And uh, we've really enjoyed, we've had high school teachers in our lab working the summers uh, for I think five summers now. Every one of them has published a paper, co-authored a paper with us uh, as part of that experience and published it in scientific journals. So we've been involved with teachers for some time and uh, not only involved in having them work in our lab, but actually up going into their classes this, most of this was in western Pennsylvania when I was at Pitt. And uh, here you can actually see one of our teachers and one of my graduates bringing science right into the classroom. And we did that with lots and lots of classrooms in western Pennsylvania. And then a year ago, uh, I moved. And I moved back to New York, back to Rensselaer uh, Polytechnic Institute, better known as RPI. And uh, I always like to tell people that I don't just uh, talk about environmental science. I try to be a uh, proponent of it. This is the house that we bought a year ago. And it's a, it's a passive solar house, and it also has solar panels on the, on the roof of the house. So it really is a, a perfect house for someone who uh, writes about environmental science for students, sort of be a, an example of uh, how to have a, a smaller impact on the environment. And as part of the reason I came to Rensselaer was to direct a new uh, major aquatic project on a place called Lake George, New York. And if you don't know, Lake George is uh, sort of a famous place in the Northeast. Really beautiful lake, fairly pristine, uh, economically huge tourist attraction. 
Um, but the lake has been changing over the past 30, 35 years uh, due to human impacts, we think. And uh, so I was asked to come in and direct this project, and we call it the Jefferson Project. And this is a project between Rensselaer and IBM and the conservation group. And the project really is to try to understand how how lakes are changing and to use really high-tech monitoring. And you see one of those devices right here. This device can, can uh, have a sensor that goes all the way down to the bottom of the lake, about 200 feet, and sense everything, oxygen, temperature, the amount of algae. Oh, we have sensors all over the lake. And it allows us to understand how the lake is changing over space and over time. And, uh, and that really gives us this goal of, of making what we call the Queen of American Lakes, that's another name for Lake George, to make it what we call the world's smartest lake. It is technologically the smartest lake in the world. So everything we have is based in Lake George, but what we do is generalizable, and of course the impact that we have will be global. Uh, so that's sort of my background, but what we want to talk about is this, the environmental science of freshwater. So we want to think about that in, in just a few different ways. We want to think about using water around the world, what the issues are. We want to think about water use in the U.S., a little closer to home, and then talk a little bit about water use in California. And then wrap it up with some discussion of uh, current water conservation strategies and how important those are to the environmental science of water. So let's talk about the first one, water use around the world. It, as you probably know, fresh water, incredibly important global resource. About a sixth of the world doesn't even have access to clean, fresh water. Uh, so it's a, uh, it's a huge environmental issue. I think most people are surprised, and, and many of our teachers likely know this, that the amount of fresh water is pretty rare in the world. Only about 3% of all water is fresh water. And most of that isn't even available it's in, in the form of ice and glaciers. So really, less than 1% of all the water on Earth is accessible. That is, it's groundwater. It's surface water like lakes and ponds and rivers. But most of it's marine, and most of the fresh water that we have is, is blocked up as ice and glaciers. So we're talking about a really small amount of water uh, that's available for the kind of things that we need. And of course, this, this causes lots and lots of stresses. You're looking now at a world map, and in red would be the countries that use water faster than it's being replaced in the ground or in streams and lakes and rivers. And, and certainly the U.S. is sort of in the medium to high stress. Places like California right now, Texas last year, certainly feel lots of stress. So on average, the U.S. has, has medium stress in terms of the amount of water we use. So all of that causes uh, what I know folks in California all refer to this as the water wars. It can be in California. It can be literal wars, as we see in the Middle East. Lots and lots of competition for fresh water. So, of course, we need to think about how we use it um, and how we can be smarter in how we use it. So let's think about just in the U.S. How do we use water in the U.S.? What are the, uh, what are the issues here? I find that my students are really shocked that most of the water we're talking about isn't used for drinking water or bathrooms or washing dishes. It's actually a pretty small fraction. What you see here is that fraction is called domestic water. Nearly three quarters of all water that we use in the U.S. is actually used for irrigation, that is on farms, and for thermoelectric power. And that's really for cooling off thermoelectric power, making steam, cooling nuclear reactors, that sort of thing. So uh, a really large portion of the water we use uh, is really critical for the food that we eat and the electricity that we generate. So it, it has wide-ranging effects uh, if we don't have enough water. I also think it, it's interesting to look at U.S. population growth to see since 1950 how much we've grown, nearly doubled the U.S. population. And uh, when I talk to students about this, we think how would that affect water withdrawal? And of course, everyone expects, well, the, the amount of water we use coming out of the ground or coming out of lakes um, must be a lot bigger. But in fact, it's not. It's actually stabilized since about the 1970s. And, and it's stabilized quite a bit that despite the growing population, uh, and this is, uh, as you see the citation from the U.S. Geological Survey, they do this every five years. It's stabilized, actually gone down in the last five years, the amount of water that we use in the U.S. 
And uh, what we'll talk about later is why. We talk about the conservation strategies that are responsible for the amount of water going down despite the number of people using it going up. And we can then move to California and uh, think more specifically about water use in California. As you may appreciate, it's the state with the largest amount of water use, uh, according to the U.S. Geological Survey, about 38 billion gallons a day. Now, it's all water, both uh, salt water and fresh water. Most of it's fresh water. Salt water is used by some uh, thermoelectric plants. And this is just an infographic you can find at USGS. Um, it, it's an interesting one for California that the, the daily water withdrawals is enough to drain uh, Shasta Lake in Northern California about every 40 days. That's a huge reservoir, as you may know. And look where the water comes from. As some of you may know this very well living there, when we think about fresh water, you see the size of that bubble. The vast majority is used for irrigation, for farms, for the things like the Central Valley where we grow an awful lot of the, the world's uh, vegetables, certainly a lot of the United States vegetables, huge amount there uh, used for irrigation. So about 61% of all water and 74% of the fresh water, that means not, not the salt water, um, is used just for irrigation. The amount used for public water supply is, is relatively much smaller than that, as you see by the, the size of those water droplets. Again, a really, I think a really interesting, useful infographic to show your students if you're so inclined, and, and we're happy to provide all of these. They're also online where you can get them. Uh, occasionally, you'll see in the corner a page number, and that refers to a page in our book where you can actually see that graphic as well. Yeah, and, and quickly this is interrupt. Sorry, Rick. Um, I did just want to let you guys know that we will be sending out a PDF of this presentation after, um, yes. probably tomorrow or Friday. Very, very happy to supply copies of, of this to, to anyone who might find it useful uh, in, in teaching these topics. Here's California. This is the, cap, uh, the county map of California. Just give you a sense and your students a sense of where water is used the most. Of course, in red is where uh, we have the most millions of gallons per day uh, being used in California. So it's interesting to look at that versus you know population distribution in California as well. And then. As you saw in the, uh, across the U.S., here is the amount of water used in California over about 50 years. And I think it also surprises people. I think that the population of California has doubled in that time. But the amount of water hasn't. The amount of water used hasn't. Agriculture and total water, again, it's, it's, it's been pretty stable over the past 40 years or declined some in the past. And uh, the last data available there from UC Davis was 2005. Uh, probably declined even more in the last few years because of the drought. But a much larger population over 50 years, but the amount of water being used hasn't really changed, which is good news when you don't have a lot of available water. And the reason for that is largely due to some really wise conservation strategies. And there are a bunch of conservation strategies that uh, people have come up with over the years, either locally or at the federal level, to get better conservation uh, of the water that we do have. And here's just one. This is a, a figure from our book that just compares the different kinds of ways that you can irrigate crops. And the first A is, is furrow irrigation, where basically flood the, the, the little valleys in between the, the, uh, the rows of plants. <clears throat> the second is flood irrigation, where you simply submerge everything briefly. Uh, and some of it can run off, some of it can evaporate, et cetera. The next is spray irrigation, just like it sounds. You do lose some to evaporation, spray the mist into the air. And then drip irrigation, which is, as you can see here, just a, a hose that has tiny holes in it, and it really applies the water right where the plant is. And why these are interesting is you can look at the efficiency, that is how much water actually gets to the plant. And furrow irrigation has the lowest efficiency flood irrigation is a little bit higher. And as you see as we go along, you've got something like drip irrigation. While it's a bigger cost investment, and that's relevant, 95% uh, efficiency. So you're wasting much less water to grow the same plant. So that can be really high if it's an option for the particular kind of crop you're talking about. It's not an option for all crops. Um, but it is a good example of there's different ways to irrigate, and there are uh, benefits and limitations to each of those different ways. Let's one way to think about conserving water. A second one that a lot of industries and thermoelectric plants are thinking about 
is moving from what we call once through to closed loop cooling system. Once through means you use the water to cool and you dump it back to a river or a lake or some other body of water and you basically are consuming it, warming it up and dumping it back and you're using water uh, to do that. The closed loop systems are where you really are using water to cool off machinery or cool off your thermoelectric plant and then you let that water cool and you reuse that water again. So you consume much, much less water more and more plants and industries are doing this. It just uh, makes it, you know, there's a cost investment, but it makes it much uh, less problematic for some other things, like releasing too much heat into rivers or lakes. So some of that is happening now. So that's another way to conserve water, is just keep reusing the same water over and over using these closed loop systems. Now, in your own homes and in your students' homes, some of you uh, probably remember or still uh, have uh, toilets that use a lot of water per flush. And in 1994, the federal government came out with new standards. So instead of the old toilets that took about 27 liters per flush, the new regulations, not that new anymore, 1994, were that it should take six liters per flush. So think about that's one-fourth the amount of water that the old toilets used to use compared to the new toilets. Now, of course, as you know, in, in some places, there's even the dual flush toilets where you can choose whether you want a little bit of water or a lot of water, depending on what you're trying to flush down. So that is another way that that can happen, and I believe that was actually started in Australia and is now moving to the U.S. and, and Europe quite a bit. Interestingly, uh, for shower heads, there was also new federal standards, or there were federal standards in 1994 that had to be further clarified last year. And the reason is, in 1994, there was a federal standard that said your shower head shouldn't produce anything newly sold, shouldn't produce more than nine liters per minute. So manufacturers decided that one way around that was to make shower heads that had multiple heads so that no individual head would produce more than nine liters per minute, but the whole array of heads might produce, say, 75 liters per minute. So last year, the federal government further clarified what they mean is the entire shower device that you have, whether you have one head or multiple heads, can't be more than nine liters per minute. And as we see, these, these multiple heads are getting harder and harder to find those that produce a, a large amount of water uh, because they're really just trying to get around that, that federal standard. So that's been further clarified, and that, of course, saves a great deal of water. That's about one-eighth of the water of these uh, multiple shower heads. Um, high efficiency washers, you've probably seen these. Uh, on average, roughly, the uh, conventional washer uses about 160 liters of water per load. The high efficiency averages about 80 liters per load. So uh, there's an interesting question here for, for our students that uh, we like to ask them. For example, that the high efficiency washers, on average, cost about three times as much as a conventional washer. And, you know, there's some variation there, but about three times as much. So one of the things we ask them in our book is, what's the break-even time if you just cared about when you would get your investment back in a high-efficiency washer? If you saved money in water, like if you were buying public water, but you paid more money for the washer, uh, we have them do the math and, and, uh, and work that out and ask themselves, you know, from a financial point of view, is it worth it? And then differently from sort of a, an environmental point of view, where you just care about saving water, is it worth it? And you can get really different answers and interesting uh, discussions when you think about that. And what, you know, Andy Friedman and I always do in our book, uh, we try to provide the data so students can really do the thinking for themselves. They can do the math. They can have, you know, think about this, have discussions, but we never preach what you should do. We do provide the data to let them have a serious discussion about uh, what different people think is the right thing to do. So it's, it's intentionally not made to be preachy, but really just provide the information and, and they can decide what to do on their own. Another water conservation strategy, particularly in the desert southwest, using uh, desert adapted landscaping. So don't plant a lawn in the middle of Arizona if you don't have much water to, to water it. Lots of towns are, are uh, promoting this sort of thing and giving uh, financial incentives to do this. And, and it's estimated you can save uh, about 2,000 liters of water per square meter of lawn uh, if you don't have a lawn that you have to water on a frequent basis, but instead have a, a landscape that's really adapted to the local conditions, like desert conditions. So that's another way to, to save water. 
And, and this one's really interesting and relevant to California, the use of gray water. And gray water we define as the, the water coming out of baths and showers, sinks and washing machines, not water coming from toilets, not water coming from kitchens or dishwashers that has a lot of food and, and more bacterial issues with it. But uh, some years ago, Sydney, Australia estimated that if they started using gray water, they could save about 50,000 liters per household per year uh, if they could use it for irrigation, for example. And as some of you may know, in, in 2010, the, the, the drought was really getting started there, and California finally agreed to allow gray water uh, for people to irrigate lawns and trees. Now, there's a, there's a lot of caveats to that and a lot of guidelines that you can look up in your in your California state laws. I've, I reviewed them recently. But, you know, this can save a tremendous amount of water. Rather than, than sending this gray water, which really is just water and some soap, uh, rather than sending it to the local water treatment plant and sending it out to a river or an ocean, wherever it ends up going, um, you know, you can actually make use of that and not use really nice clean water just to water your lawn or water your trees. So that's uh, been another reason that California has been able to, to save on the amount of water it uses. Uh, and that brings us to, of course, what you all know better than I do, the, the drought, the four-year drought that we're in California. Just uh, I think it's just a great shot of Fulton Lake from where it was in 2011 to where it is now. And, and lots and lots of your reservoirs, of course, look like this. Serious drought uh, is having a huge impact and, and you may have seen signs like these. This is some that I found uh, looking around. Uh, real big campaigns to conserve water even more than California had been conserving water, and, and some restrictions from the governor, as I understand it, to, to really work on conserving water. And Californians, as you probably know well, redoubled their efforts and reduced over a two-year period. Oops, there's a typo there. From 2013 to 2015, uh, reduced water by another 30% which I just think is really impressive that folks were able to reduce it uh, by that much. That, that's a substantial uh, savings of water. And uh, as you may also know, uh, there's some uh, likely good news coming. The El Nino is coming around again, which has the uh, potential to really uh, bring a lot of water to California. And I thought I would just take a second to just review this for those of you who, who uh, uh, teach things like the El Nino events. And what really happened at the top is a normal year. And in a normal year, we have high pressure uh, air over by South America, low pressure air over by Australia, and that makes the wind blow in that direction. You have the warm surface water going from South America to Australia. You have the trade winds going sort of in a, in a northwesterly direction. And then about every five to eight years, for reasons we don't really understand very well, those pressures switch. So you have higher pressure by Australia, lower pressure by South America. So the wind switches. And now the wind is blowing the surface of the ocean, and it switches. And it has a totally uh, substantial impact on the whole world. And what happens? Because these winds are bringing air that has particular heat and particular amount of moisture with it, and it changes everything. So this, this reversal of air pressures changes the trade winds and the trade winds are carrying heat and moisture with them. I think here's just a great graphic. This is from NOAA. Uh, again, we'll provide this, but you can find it online as well. And you see in California, in, southern, in the southern half of California, that compared to an average year, uh, it's expected that you'll be about 50% more precipitation in California than the average year. Now, it's a lot more than the current year you've been having, but 50% better than the average year, uh, even up into northern California maybe 33% uh, more uh, water coming in. So it's been described recently as the Godzilla El Nino because it, it looks like it's really forming to be a really strong El Nino year. Of course, other areas, like where I used to work in Michigan, that's going to be a lot drier. They're going to have all kinds of drought up there, which affects farms there. So it really has a big impact, uh, both positively and negatively around the U.S., but also around the world. It has a big impact on agriculture, big impact on people's lives. Uh, look at Florida, 70% more precipitation than they normally get. So if the predictions from NOAA are correct, the prediction is that the California drought will end, um, and, and these El Ninos usually come November, December, January. So that's the expectation. By the way, here's the temperature expectation. 
So it's going to be warmer, but it's going to be wetter uh, there in California. So to wrap up this sort of overview of fresh water, absolutely a critical resource. In lots of parts of the world is being consumed faster than it's being resupplied, causing lots of impacts on agriculture, uh, electric generation, domestic use of that water. In California and throughout the U.S., the withdrawals of water have actually stabilized despite the population doubling uh, over that time. And it's really stabilized due to a wide range of water conservation strategies. As a nation, we're getting much smarter about how we use our water and, and recognizing how important water is for all of us uh, that we don't just take it for granted. Uh, and despite these strategies, the periodic droughts uh, really can happen in places like California. You know, a lot of these droughts are uh, natural. Uh, others uh, may, uh, may be related to climate change. It's a, it's a bit hard to, to make that really uh, strong argument right now. That's one of the predictions of climate change, of course. Uh, and it poses some major challenges to water use. So with that, I'd love to open it up to questions. Feel free to, to ask whatever you like, either about the, the, the material we covered, the AP book. I'll tell you, Andrew Friedman and I have been just delighted that when we put out the first edition, you know, you write these and you never know what people will think. And uh, we found that teachers have been our best proponents, that they have recommended it to all their fellow teachers. So we've been thrilled at the really warm reception of having a book that from the very start was written and designed for the AP courses and the AP test. So with that, I open it to questions. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Um, it's Nicole again. So if you guys have any questions, please feel free to either raise your hand um, or send me a message in the chat. As we said before, these are, um, this is a book provided with a lot of wonderful graphics that um, I will be sending you out tomorrow, and I invite you to use it in your classroom um, and you know, provide us with some feedback on how your students liked it. Um, yeah, if there are any questions, uh, we do have one question about the um, about the supplemental materials in the book, which I can answer. Um, I will say that this textbook comes with a wraparound teacher's edition, a teacher resource flash drive, which has worksheets, test quizzes, professional development videos, all sorts of things that you can use in your classroom. We also have a test bank CD um, and a companion website, which houses a lot of the materials for both you and your students to use for free. Um, does anyone else have any questions? Sure. Um, so we have another question. Um, this one's for you, Rick. I definitely can't answer this one. Um, this one comes from Joseph. Can you speak to the impact of a warmer winter on the water supplies in California over the longer term? I think uh, I was Rick, muted. Oh, sure. Did, were you, do you want me to repeat the question? No, I, I heard the question. It was about warmer winters. I think I was I was inadvertently muted there for a moment. Oh, um, all right. Yeah, so, so the warmer winter, certainly it, it's, it's, there's two, two aspects to that. One is you think about evaporation of water bodies uh, with warmer winters. But the other, I think, really important one is, is when you have warmer winters, you typically have less snow accumulation. You have less uh, sort of a, a peak in snow melt, which a lot of communities depend on, whether it's for irrigation or for things like trout and salmon to be running up the rivers in the springtime. So those, those warmer winters certainly are of concern if, uh, if the result is we don't have enough snowpack uh, melting down in the spring into the, into the streams and rivers and lakes. Uh, so it's both sort of a, a concern for uh, being, uh, that storage for, for people to have access to water, but also for lots of wildlife to have that access to. Thank you. Um, we have another question that's come in. How do we access the presentation materials? Um, that is going to be in two ways. Number one, I will be sending you a recording of the video via email, and in that email, I will attach the PDF of the presentation. Um, I will be sending it to the email that you registered your you registered with. So um, keep an eye on that. My email address um, is was on the screen. I can put it up again. Um, you can also email me if you have any issues. Uh, we have two more questions. So these are for you, Rick. Um, the first one is from Erin. And it is, oh, let's pull it up again. 
Um, can Rick address your, his thoughts on the link between potential hydrofracking in New York State in the future and its impact on the water supply reservoirs? Boy, that's a great question. Uh, first, I'll say I, I, I shared my screen again so you can see the emails for both Nicole and for me. And I literally encourage you to uh, email me if you have any particular questions with your course, with the textbook, if you happen to be using our textbook, whatever you like, the two emails I think should be in front of you now. Um, but on the hydrofracking, you know, hydrofracking is really uh, a major issue. And, and as I said, I, I uh, came from 15 years uh, at the University of Pittsburgh, which is, you know, one of the centers of, of fracking right now. Um, I lived in, in one of the counties that uh, has a major fracking operation going on. And, you know, it, it's, it's a really important challenge because uh, hopefully everyone can see that there are uh, two sides of this. There's the uh, side that all of us need energy and all of us are uh, demanding uh, power, whether it's heating our homes, powering our vehicles, et cetera. So, you know, as I tell my students, we're all part of the reason that we're going after more energy. It's certainly true that, that once the gas is out of the ground, that uh, we think of it as cleaner, providing, you know, less CO2 for the amount of heat or energy you get out of it. But then there's the other side, the risk uh, of, of what it can do to groundwater if it's not done safely, if it's not done correctly. We now have enough uh, examples of, of mistakes that have happened um, when they, they put the liners down into the, uh, the casing down into the ground. If it's not sealed well, um, we can have chemicals escape. Um, so, you know, in Pennsylvania, I think um, there are a number of accidents that have happened. I don't think, as far as we know, we don't know a lot about this. It's not really uh, open very well. Uh, but as far as we know, the, those accidents have been uh, relatively rare. I don't have the number in front of me, but you know, probably less than 10 percent of the, the, the wells have that problem. But I think New York has been very wise in putting it off and waiting and learning from states like Pennsylvania and West Virginia and learning what accidents can happen, how to regulate it better, how to, how to be careful about it. But it is really a challenge because the, 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 the opportunity to have an energy source that makes us energy independent of the rest of the world is, is obvious that it's, it's a very positive thing and that the risk to our groundwater is a very uh, concerning thing as well. So, uh, you know, my reaction to that, having lived there, is, is um, uh, hopefully really balanced, and, and that's really what Andy and I try to do in this book, is, is it's not preaching uh, any particular viewpoint. It really is trying to be balanced, trying to acknowledge uh, multiple sides of environmental issues and, uh, and not just taking one side, and to try to be balanced and provide the information so that students and teachers can have discussions like this about you know, should we be doing this or shouldn't we? And obviously, it's, it's a complex kind of issue. This and lots of others are complex issues, or we wouldn't be having these difficult discussions over these things. So I think, uh, you know, that's really, in, in a microcosm, that's what this book tries to do, is it, it really tries to have this balanced approach. It's not depressing the way some books are that say, you know, the end of the world is coming and it's your fault. It really tries to be balanced. It tries to look for the positive stories. It acknowledges the negative stories, um, the, the famous case studies that all of you probably are teaching as well. Um, but we really wanted to be balanced. We wanted to, to offer some hope to students. So at the end of each chapter, we have a, a pretty positive story about how we've come up with environmental solutions to some of our problems. Uh, so that's what I'd say about fracking. It's complex. There are reasons it's being done. Uh, not just profit, but there are real reasons for doing this to extract more energy that all of us uh, are requiring for our lives, and there are real concerns with it, too. Thank you. Um, we do have another question. This is our last one, so if anyone has any more questions, please feel free to chat them to me now. Um, this last question comes from Matthew. Um, first of all, thank you for taking the time to do this webinar. My students have asked some good questions about understanding how ocean and wind patterns relate to each other. Do you have any suggestions or activities to help students understand the complex global precipitation patterns? Yeah, we, we, uh, great question. We, we, we work on that in, in one of our chapters. Um, and I think it, 
I have to remember, it's one of the early chapters in the book where we talk about patterns of climate. The first thing we try to do is, is in all of our chapters, particularly in this one, we try to tell them why they should even care uh, and, and that there are these, these patterns of repeated climates. And, and in the second edition, I believe we do this with the story of, uh, of making wine around the world and that the best wine around the world is typically made in 30 degrees latitude, north and south. And to sort of just say, have you, you probably never thought about this, but isn't that odd that, you know, in, in Australia and in South Africa and in California and in France, all of these places, they all grow the best wine grapes, and they all happen to have the same climate. They all happen to have Mediterranean climate. We talk a bit about that. And then we say, in fact, this is just one example of the same environment being found in multiple places, but they're all at the same latitude. And we try to get them interested in that way and then talk about what it is that drives these things. So we really have tried to walk through the steps that determine this and, and make them think about that. And then at the end of the book, we start talking about some of the, the implications of this. You know, one of the fun stories I like to tell my students is, you know, we think about the French making the best wine, and as climate has changed and these uh, these biomes are starting to shift, uh, for example, the British are now making some of the best wine that the French used to make 50 years ago. Uh, of course, that really annoys the heck out of the French. Um, and uh, so it's just a fun example of not only where the biomes are, how they're formed, but how it actually impacts things like agriculture, how it impacts uh, those sorts of things, and how it impacts uh, nations relating to each other, like England and France over wine, uh, how it impacts California winemakers and some of their wines, or uh, those the best varieties of grapes are shifting north as well. That whole topic, I think, is, is first motivated by why should we even care about this topic, and then when you intrigue them in those kind of ways, uh, they're more inclined to pay attention to all right, what are the many things? And as you know very well, there are many things that go into this. It's the, the Coriolis effect. It's the heating, the differential heating of Earth and, and the oceans and the water expanding. All of these things uh, come together. It's a pretty complex system, but, but what we have found is it helps to start off with what is an interesting pattern across the globe, a repeated pattern of a particular biome, uh, maybe it's tropical rainforest, but other things that you can think about, like we grow the same food in the same places in just a few places around the world. Uh, that makes it a little more interesting for them to pay attention to the rest. Thank you. Rick, I also just found some of our activities and uh, from our book companion site. Do you mind if I take the ball back and I can show them um, what oh, that looks like for our book? Yep. All righty. So I'm going to quickly share my desktop um, just to show you an example of what this looks like in our textbook. Um, so you would have, um, with adoption, you do get access to our book companion site, which does show all of our chapters and here are some of our you know, free student resources. But I quickly looked up the chapter on, let me share it correctly. Um, the chapter on, I did chapter four, which is global climates and biomes. Kind of took a shot in the dark there. I wasn't sure if this would be right. But here's an example of one of the activities that we provide. Um, with, um, as Rick said, all of our chapters start with a case study to kind of grab your student's interest and really make them want to learn about the topic. Um, and not just so they get a five on their exam, but actually be very interested in it. And then you can see an example of one of the activities we suggest with um, different cards. And then we provide you with this table that your students can fill in. And then you have the answers here. So that's one of the um, activities that we suggest. Um, I can send you a sample of these teacher resource materials. You can take a look at some of the other ones. But we did get a question on this topic, so I figured I'd um, show you what it looks like. Do you guys have any other questions? Nicole, do you have a, a PDF of that chapter? I think it's chapter four. I don't actually. I have it on my iPad, <laughs> but oh, not okay. on my computer. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have it available either. 
of that. Yeah, I, if you go to our um, catalog page and just search environmental science, it will be the first title that pops up, um, and you can see some samples online here as well. And we are always happy to sample you a copy of our ebook or our teacher's edition ebook, mm -hmm. the day digital copy. So if you want to get a better idea of you know the actual content, um, we can send that to you. Does anyone have any other questions? I don't see anything else coming through the chat. Um, so I do just want to say thank you guys for joining us on this Wednesday evening. If you'd like to get in contact with us for any reason, another question that comes up, a suggestion for one of our webinars, we love hearing what kind of topics you'd like to hear about, anything at all, um, please feel free to reach out to either myself or Rick. I will be sending you a copy of the presentation that we used tonight as well as the recording. And if you need to see anything else, you know, please just let us know. But thank you for joining us. Yes, I like Nicole's comments. Thank you very much. We appreciate you taking the time from your really busy schedules. Uh, to spend some time with us, and uh, please uh, don't don't be afraid to, to send me an email if you have questions either. And thank you. Have a very nice evening. Thanks, everyone.